Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. If you are watching on YouTube, you can find out more about what we do at officehours.global. Our first hour is general discussion about media and virtual production, just general questions. Second hour is something we want to spend a little bit more time on. Today, we're going to talk about run of show. <laughs> so, so we're going to talk about uh, basically like how do we design shows and what works and what doesn't work. So if you've got questions about that, go ahead and throw it into the into Makana. Um, and then tomorrow, we're going to, I know this is funny, gaff tape. We talk about sticky. It's a sticky subject. Um, but we're going to talk about gaff tape and how we uh, gaff things down and how we Velcro things down and how we connect things. I know. I know it sounds like we couldn't talk for an hour about gaff tape. You are so wrong. <laughs> we can have a short show. It's not going to be a short. It's not going to be a short show. <laughs> Celery and carrots, just the base of a soup. All right. So, uh, so we're going to have a have a good time tomorrow talking about that. If you want to find out more about what we're doing here, uh, you can go to officehours.global. You'll see our schedule and uh, a lot of other things. All right. Go ahead, Bill. Let's. What do we got? We've got a lot of questions, and let's start with this one from Stephen Bowen in Boston, Massachusetts. He says, what are your recommendations for bringing individual feeds of remote presenters into vMix? I like vMix Call, but they need to interact with chat and Q&A in Zoom. Zoom ISO looks solid, but only have access to PCs. Go ahead, Guy. Yeah, I would say Zoom Rooms. I mean, it is like 50 bucks a month, but with the NDI connectivity, it's, it's pretty solid. And um, you can see if I cut over to uh, the back end. This is what it looks like if you go into um, launch the controller. So this, this is what's pretty neat about this is you no longer need a uh, iPad. You could actually just do this in the cloud. So you would go to like manage participants and here would be your participants. And then you can pin and you have your, your three NDI outputs. So you pin that person and now they're live on NDI. So pretty, pretty slick setup. It's uh, takes a little configuring, but once you get it dialed in, it works wonderfully. So that's the way I would do it. Go ahead, Jeffrey. My old standby is is just that I have a uh, Blackmagic uh, quad uh, uh, fourplex. Oh, what's the name of that card? Anyway, uh, the Blackmagic uh, deck link quad, that's what I was looking for, uh, that I can take from other machines and then bring it into the main computer. And then they, they have their own feed, which is why I really love having that Mac mini with the Zoom ISO and the, the uh, the pluggable cards, because then I can just take cables straight into my other computer. It's a really nice. Next question. Kenneth Jones, Seattle, Washington, up next. Conversations with Tony Mobley had a bit of a headache last night with an echo. What was the solution? Now go ahead, Jeffrey. So uh, uh, apparently after sound checks, they started doing the show and there was some sort of uh, uh, loop back that was going on on one of the uh, one of the machines. So they had to stop. They had to reassess. And then uh, it started about an hour late, but uh, they got everything worked out and, uh, and they had a great show. And do we know where that loop, where the return was happening? Yeah. I don't know if I should publicly say that though. Okay. Yeah. I mean, usually what the, the most challenging ones that you have when it comes to audio is, is working with folks that actually know a lot about audio because they can build a pretty complex chain um, that, that makes things more complicated. And so that's, that's usually it, you know, cause they're doing, they're doing a bunch of things with their system. And so that's always a, a challenge there. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah. I think one of the things that I have struggled with at my desk here is I have built a complex enough system that I can't, I can't verbalize what I'm doing. I, I can't even draw it out. And I find that it, it's super, it's just super complicated. And I wish I was better at drawing it or, but it works. So I leave it alone. <laughs> well, a lot of times people are like, why don't you just fix your, what, fix something in my little studio? I'm like, I don't think you understand. Like, like there's like a, it's working right now. And we just want to make sure we have time. Cause usually, you know, like I had to do one thing last week where I had to show the scopes and, um, yeah. And I was going to be, oh, that would take me 15 minutes. It was, I got up at three o'clock in the morning and barely got it done before the show. You know, it was just like, it was, it was three or four hours of, you know, what, an un, what's a astounding non clean show. <laughs> like, yeah. Like me, me trying to figure this out. What's astounding is that the tiniest, like, uh, I'll give you an example. Um, a couple, uh, last week, I was making a phone call and I sat back down. And my ear pods took over the computer. Yeah. And it took me like 45 minutes and a reboot to get everything to work again. Like I have it, to admit, I have now, I now carry around wired headphones with a little yeah. lightning adapter 
Um, I just I saw those last night. I, you saw me doing them last night. I I have I have all these old wired Edemotic wired headphones, and I have a bunch of them now because I've lost confidence in my AirPods. <laughs> like because you know I just can't. I, they're 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 they don't connect. They connect to the wrong thing. They you know and so so the um uh, so I I, I I use them every once in a while, but but I don't use them near. I was using them all the time, and now I I barely use them. There's clearly just, part of the logic of how they connect that I don't understand. Yeah. Yeah. So the, um, uh, so anyway, yeah. So I think that again, for those of us who have complex change, it, it's really easy for things to get out of whack and it takes a lot of testing. I think that's what people underestimate is just how much testing is required to do a show, you know, like it is, you got to push through everything. And the thing that'll get you is the thing you didn't test before the show. <laughs> like, you know, and, um, you know, I did a, I did an event yesterday. I think we rehearsed the open for the event, not the evening concert, but the day event. I think we rehearsed it maybe 20 times. <laughs> like, you know, yeah, like 20 times, like, oh, let's do that one more time. And that playback wasn't perfect. And this isn't, you know, like, you know, but but you gotta get like, that's that's what it takes. And we had basically for all the people that were gonna be there, we had uh, stand-ins. So we had actors actually doing the thing. Because the one thing I've learned is that if I do it to just chairs, it won't be the same. <laughs> and and the people will do goo goofy things. And so I hire stand-ins. I had seven people that I paid just to sit there and and talk while I'm, you know, while we're figuring out our camera angles and we're figuring out run a show and we're figuring out all the bits and pieces. They're just, their job is there is just to improvise, you know, and, and it, like night and day, but it, it does take, you know, it's hours and hours and hours. Like for me, for a show I do, it's, it's three or four hours of testing minimum to make that actually happen. Uh, go ahead, Bill. I was just going to say, I, I decided to try to support our friends last night and pop onto the show. So I heard this happen. I wasn't able to stay very long, but it, and it was one, it wasn't just a normal little echo. It was one of those echoes that the secondary is delayed by enough to really make it noticeable. And then you get a tertiary in, a, in the fourth and fifth and sixth and seventh order. I mean, it just kept growing in terms of echo to the point where you literally, I am astonished that Tony was able to maintain as long as he did attempting to do the show and thinking maybe they're not here hearing this, maybe I should just keep going because I'm the host. He did a magnificent job, but this was such a uh, an audio problem that it became unintelligible really quickly. So, uh, and, and I think it was right to stop and redo it. You know, the thing is, is that there's a temptation to just try to muscle through it because it's live and you're in front of people and everything amen. else. If I'm in front of 300, 500, or 5,000 people, I may try to muscle through it. You know, I may, I may try to do something like that. But, um, but if I'm in front of less than 100 people, I will always just reset because the 99% of your viewership is going to come later. Like, you know, and so you don't want the record that you have on YouTube. It's the hardest, like, streaming to YouTube is actually one of the hardest things to do in media because you are not only going live but you are building a permanent record that you don't want to go back and change because you'll lose all your stats and everything else. So you have to be, you know, like if you do something like we, we worked on Thanksgiving live one time for um, the food network. And as soon as they finished it, it was in New York. As soon as they finished it, there was a producer with like 30 edits for the EBS operator. So that by the time it showed up in um, LA on the West coast, it was all different. Like they had cut out, take this out, take this out. This is a bad camera shot. This is, and they just, re-edited the whole thing. So the only time you saw it in its raw form with tons of rehearsal and 80 people working on it was once. <laughs> you know, after that, every time you see it after that, it's going to be all edited down. So, but we don't get to do that on YouTube. We have to get it right the first time, which is why it takes so much rehearsal. Go ahead, David. Um, I, I can't even begin to imagine the complexity of the audio routing systems that you use, Alex, on your shows. But I, I just want to thank Chris for reminding me that I'm not the only one who doesn't even understand my own audio routing setup in my at my desk. I, so I don't have comms. Um, all the other panelists have to have comms. I don't have comms because I, I don't know how to do that. Like, like just so you know, like I just want to make sure it's clear. Like I don't have comms because like I've got two different networks and they're on Dante and I and I tied something together and then I pulled it apart and now I don't know what's going on and and so I got forced into it. I now I can probably fix it very quickly because my my. POE died to this morning during after hours of the pre-show. So, um, so anyway, so I, I now will probably have it sorted by Monday. Go ahead, Kenneth. Well, you could tell they were sliding down that slippery slope when uh, Tony pulled the IFB out of his ear. Uh, that was an issue. 
Um, <laughs> That's the ultimate issue. Like we are having trouble as the IFB comes out of the year. Like, and for kudos to kudos to Aaron. He maintained his NASA voice throughout the entire process. Well, I'm sure he was sweating bullets at the time, but he did a very nice job on the air. You you can tell when people are ready to do live or not is when things are coming apart and they're just going to keep, you know, the, 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 they're losing a wing, the engine fell off and they're like, and we're now at 10,000 feet. <laughs> you, know, like, you know, like we're at, you know, dropping at 1,000 feet per uh, per second. Uh, we're, we're probably going to hit the ground, you know, and, 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 and uh, <laughs> like, like it's all been good to know you guys, you know, a little, um, you know, so, uh, but, but I think that that's, that's when you know you have a good, good TD. So anyway, it, you know, that's when you get to see what people are made of is when they get to go through those, uh, those turns. So, so anyway, um, uh, g good work to everyone to work on that. And that's why we do these. Like, that's why, you know, um, that's why we're all working the, on these together is because we get to see new things. I mean, the, you don't, you know, the, um, uh, Malcolm Gladwell, uh, stole something. Oh, he steals a lot of things. He's <laughs> a little thief. Um, and, uh, he, uh, he stole, um, the idea of 10,000 hours that you have to do 10,000 hours to become an expert or whatever in some book he had. And he stole that from Buddhism. <laughs> so Zen Buddhism, it's 10,000 mistakes. It's, it's 10,000. Like I, I studied Eastern philosophy when I was in college and it's 10,000 mistakes, not 10,000 hours. It's 10,000 mistakes. And you want to go through those mistakes as fast as you can um, to become an expert. But it's, it's a huge difference between 10,000 hours and 10,000 mistakes um, because that's, you know, but that's what they say. That's the different difference between the novice and the master. And so us doing all these things, the things we were doing last night for the show, the things that we're doing, you just want to fail forward, you know, so well done to the team to figure it out, reset it, produce a good show. Good job. All right, let's go to the next question. Moving on, Jacob. Good night. In Indianapolis, Indiana said, what is more reliable for streaming, a single SRT or dual RTMP primary plus a backup? Now go ahead, Noah. So I think I would go with the dual RTMP. I would also suggest trying to separate the networks so that you have two completely separate pipelines that go into two separate servers ultimately, right? So basically you're creating two paths or two pipes. Uh, RTMP is like a 20 year old technology that still is pretty popular. And then SRT is kind of up and coming. And obviously SRT is better and um, more reliable on its own, but to have two solid pipelines um, would be best. If you can do two SRTs, that's even better. Go ahead, Kai. Yeah, I would say the same. I would go with the dual, especially if you can get them on two separate ne networks entirely so that you have the backup on a totally different, even if it's a uh, cellular or, or some kind of uh, uh, lower bandwidth situation where um, you're just able to get out because SRT is, is great. It stands for Secure Reliable Transport, and it is the future, but right now you're not going to get it into um, YouTube or wherever you're streaming to directly. Most likely you're going to have to transcode it into something which will, will do hard TMP. Uh, but to get out of the venue, you would I'd prefer to have... Uh, uh, RTMP and also remember that there there is a little bit of overhead with SRT upwards of 25 percent there's a great white paper from high vision who wrote the protocol that I'll put in the chat and there's a nice comparison on a data video site of uh, why they believe SRT is the future and it's, it's the same thing like uh, comparing it directly to RTMP and why the uh, there are some drawbacks to RTMP going forward I agree next question Andy Kofendorfer in Vieira, Florida says, is there a quality webcam with a zoom lens? I need to record multiple breakout sessions at low cost. Thanks. Good, Chris. Chris. Uh, yeah. uh, oh, I would say the Brio. The Brio is a good webcam. It doesn't zoom, but the 4K sensor allows you to push in on it and you can do it remotely through zoom, the software. Good, Jeffrey. Yeah, this is, uh, Brio's great. I have the huddle cam right above me that works really well for push to zoom on on 4K. Logitech, uh, uh, I talked about this yesterday. PTZ cameras are starting to show up on Amazon uh, that have some pretty good sensors in it. And of course, they'll have an optical zoom of up to 20x. Logitech has a, uh, I think it's like a 2x or something like that. PTZ camera. There, a lot of these are under five hundred dollars if you get just the USB. But if you get them with the uh, with the HDMI and SDI attached to it, no NDI, uh, you could probably get them for about six seven hundred dollars. Yeah, and and um, a lot of times if you're looking for something on you know that's less expensive, some of the used stuff, the Sony the little Sony's that have interchangeable lenses and and so on and so forth, or, or even some of them just have better zooms. You can get them for three four hundred dollars, and and you can um, actually get a pretty good 
pretty good camera to do those things. Um, so I'm, <laughs> my webcam is a 6K, so I think that's great. You can put all kinds of lenses on it. But, uh, but if you're looking for something less expensive, there's a lot of used cameras that you can get that will look better than a lot of the web cameras that you have there. I also like the Huddle Cam for this. The, the Huddle Cam with the HDMI as well as out, it just gives you a lot of control. You've got a lot of external controls to it. Um, I think it's a pretty good, pretty good camera for, for that solution. Um, next question. David Brady comes to us now from New York City. Connecting legacy SIP endpoints into Zoom and Zoom CRC, conference room connector, results in audio in and out at 68 kilobits per second. Any thoughts if this restriction is at the codec level or at Zoom? I am nearly positive it's at the codec level. And so I think that the SIP connections, uh, as I remember, they're really optimized for voice. And, um, and so they're not really optimized to provide any higher quality than that. So I'm not 100% sure, but I'm like 98, 99% sure that it's, it's the uh, codec itself. Next question. Douglas Carmichael's up next with, when I plumbed my Phantom Zero main outputs into my DigiGrid D audio interface, I noticed a slight noise floor. Is that normal with any analog audio connection? Go ahead, Mitchell. Uh, I'm not familiar with the device um, I, other than this, I haven't used it personally, but I'm saying that uh, any analog device is going to have a different noise floor than uh, and a digital noise floor, but one you can hear, something's wrong. Can check your gain staging. I, I don't think so. I mean, I, I can hear a lot. And, you know, most, almost all preamps, this is why we talk about the quality of preamps, is because uh, a lot of preamps have a noise floor in the kind of the negative 50, negative 60 range. Um, now, I know that's one of the reasons that I use a lot of sound devices stuff, because it's net noise floor is uh, like 120, negative 128 or something like that. So it's not that it's not there. As Mitchell says, they all have noise floors. But analog equipment, a lot of uh, preamps have a noise floor that is higher than you'd think. <laughs> so so it's uh, it, it's a there. Go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, in comparison, my Sony FX3, it's a high-end uh, camera. Um, if I use the inboard preamps, I can hear the noise. If I use the digital uh, adapter that goes on top, I don't hear it. So Right. And, so and I'm... Possible. And I measure it. So if you if you actually measure it, you'll see it. You'll I bet you you'll see that that little one bouncing around it at like negative sixty, or so. They they all have it. Um, but yeah, sometimes when you can hear it, it's probably in the negative forty to negative fifty range, is when you start to hear the noise floor. Um, next question. Andre Dalle in Berlin is up next. He says how to stream to Twitter with an atemic stream. Go ahead, Noah. So I haven't done this directly, but I'll try my hand at this. So basically, you're trying to send. Um, an output through the ATM Extreme, which can stream to a destination like an RTMP. Um, and so if you look at this media.twitter.com, they have different APIs for the different um, streaming, uh, like Restream and OBS and what yeah. have you. But um, I, I actually think, though, that the, 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 trick, the trick to Twitter is that you have to have a media, the media studio. And so you can't just turn it on. So you that's the thing to know is that, I mean, I... I have done this <laughs> and it's been a problem for me uh, where we you you need to make a request so you have to have a good reason for it and you have to approach twitter and there's a place if you do a search for it you can put in a media request that to get the media um studio you need the media studio to get the rtmp inputs so you know they they may have things on how to do it and and the the atem can absolutely send the rtmp as noah said but you need to get the media studio um, to be able to get the endpoints. In, in Otherwise, they want you to just use your phone. So, um, so that's the thing you have to do. And so, it takes. If you've got juice, it'll take about a day or two. <laughs> if you don't have any juice, it'll take you a couple weeks to get it to get it set up. So, think about it ahead of time. But usually, if you make a good case for it, they'll they'll give it to you. I don't, I've never heard of anyone turned down. It's just that it's a request only, and it has to go through a process to get to be able to get RTMP input. Um, next question. Liberty White in Atlanta has an interesting one. What do you normally include in your budget for contingencies, a flat rate or a percentage of the project? I go ahead, Bill. So when I had my uh, FileMaker Pro process working and I would quote out projects using that, the I had it broken into the traditional production categories of above the line and below the line and below the line was further divided into production uh, production costs and post production costs. I had in my notes at the bottom that I was applying a six percent uh, contingency to the production costs and a three percent to the below the line post production costs. However, I was working in a pretty 
medium range. My pro projects worked. There were a lot of them at the two, three, five, ten, and maybe fifteen thousand dollar level. If I was doing things at the hundred thousand dollar level, those kind of percentages I think would be pretty unreasonable unless there was a reason for it. So I think you have to adjust it depending on the level of work you're doing. Uh, but I always had those built in, and they were disclosed at the bottom so the accountants could look at it and understand what I was doing because the numbers didn't add up in the bottom if you just did the straight math of adding the columns. Go ahead, Mitchell. Percentage, usually 10%. Yeah, 10% is a normal, pretty normal way to do it. You'll find a lot of companies um, will cut the contingency off. They'll just like just go, no, we're not going to do a contingency. They just see it as another cost that's being added to their system. So, um, you know, a lot of times we take that into account as we bid all the items. Next question. Jonas Dattel, Stuttgart, Germany is up next. He says, has anybody bought the middle remote by middle things? Go ahead, Jeffrey. The, uh, I looked at that. The only thing that I, that's uh, really disappointing is this is a USB remote that you need to go into a laptop rather than IP controlled for $1,500 in some pre-order right now. I don't know if I, I don't know if I want something that I can't do something over ethernet. I have to say I haven't bought it yet, but wow. It looks cool. <laughs> so, so middle things, the middle things looks pretty exciting. I have to admit that the, the issue of the USB doesn't really bother me that much because, you know, with an ATEM, you have to have a laptop. Like you can't like go in and, you know, any ATEM, you need to have a laptop connected to it. We just, I just had this discussion with someone recently and I was like, you can't run your show without an AT without a laptop. So I think that having a laptop there and people do it, but it's crazy because you just have to be able to get in and get to the tools that you need. Um, so I, I, I find that because that's kind of table stakes, I don't, it doesn't bother me that much to, to have something that plugs in. I think middle things is just crushing it. I haven't bought anything from them yet. I just go to their website and just go, Oh, I need, I need that. <laughs> so, 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 um, I think that we're going to see kind of an exciting kind of, um, uh, arms race between middle things and, and Scarhoy, uh, because they're just building, both teams are just building incredible tools for, for what we do. Anyway. Uh, let's go to the next question. David Barton in Memphis, Tennessee is up next. He says, does anyone have experience with SEER vision? That's S-E-E-R, B-I-S-I-O-N, camera control. It seems like an excellent system for remote production. He's got a link there. It looks pretty interesting. I have not actually used it, but, um, you know, so basically what SEER vision appears to be is AI powered uh, PTZ. So it's got a PTZ camera and, or it can have a, P it can, it can actually take on a full size camera. And it is able to then, um, you know, follow the person around and um, make sure that they, you know, and the big problem that I always have is I, what I don't know about this, which I haven't done yet, is just how much control we have over things like how it frames. Um, you know, so it might be able to frame. A good example is Apple's, what do they call it? Apple's um, little thing where they pan around inside the sensor. Um, you know, whatever that is. The it Apple needs one. a Fenwick framer. It needs a Fenwick framer. It has Apple's uh, AI is got too much headroom all the time, hundred percent of the time. Like it's just, and you're just like, what are they? What 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 are they doing? Like I won't use it specifically because it's just too much headroom, you know. And I and I tested it, and I and I just and I guess I feel like as a user, I need to be able to adjust it, or I don't know who did that, but it's not right. <laughs> like it's not it's like incorrect so so um that's the problem with the ai stuff is if it's baked in and you don't have control over that now if you can do an override and say i want you to always be a little higher or i want to put the you know all the all i want on a button somewhere in the preferences for the apple one is eyes go in the top third you know like eyes go in the top third is all i need is a top third line or something like correct for proper framing i think that's what the button should be <laughs> you know, like like you can have nothing or you can have correct for proper framing all right next question Next one comes to us from Joaquin Mattis in Imperial Valley, California. He says, hello all. I'm looking for recommendations for a handheld ENG mic to be used for live interview situations in a fairly noisy environment. And he's looking for a cardioid dynamic as being preferred. The Sennheiser MD46 and ATBP4001 are my two best options so far. And he does note that mic flags are a must in this quest. Go ahead, Bill. Well, there's a lot of things that have been traditionally around forever. The Electro Voice RE series, the RE50B, you see a ton of times on live remotes by people before they started moving to labs and didn't have stick mics in front of them. The RE635 is an even older version of that. 
I would suggest um, that you look for the long length. They almost always have little uh, the 635L and the LB is in black, which can be really useful on camera. Uh, there's two other choices. The Shure SM63 LB is also a long handled black mic that is very good. And I used for a long time the Bayer M58 and got really good results for it. I think that's also easier to find in Europe if you're out there. So there's some su suggestions. There's a lot of good ones. Go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, like Bill said, all the way from the old uh, Electro Voice 635A, my first microphone, by the way. But of the two you mentioned there, I would prefer the Sennheiser uh, MD46. Uh, flags, uh, it, just so for those people who don't know what a flag is, uh, a flag is the plastic box that goes around the body of the microphone. You can see it on the screen there uh, that has your logo or your camera logo. But the thing to keep in mind when you're getting a microphone, particularly for EFP, which is electronic field production, or ENG, which is for news gathering, is that the ENG is very rough on microphones. You can see a lot of dinged up microphones on your national news. So uh, make sure you buy one that has a case or a, a something you can put it in because the mic will get beat up. Yeah, um, I was trying to find what we were answering this question that we with the uh, mic flags that that we have bought from because they're uh, um, they're they're really great. Uh, I'll note that MarkerTech has a, a long history of having those. Um, yeah, the uh, Impact uh, PBS. Impact PBS, impactpbs.com. So that's the, um, that's the, that's the company. <laughs> like just, just like there's a, a lot of other people that have it, but I got to tell you, like uh, in broadcast, Impact PBS, it's, it, they're kind of like the audio implements of mic flags. So just that, that's the one piece to look at. And the mic that I've used uh, for live interviews forever is still an SM58. I mean, there's a lot of other ones, and I'm sure that they have other things, but I still use the same one. Uh, go, yeah, go ahead, Guy. Yeah, one last quick thing. Um, Mark Corner, one of the panelists that's jumped on here previously, we went to this car event, and uh, one of the most important things that I learned in post-editing uh, this was you need to train your talent to point that microphone in the right direction. So more important than almost anything is you'll see that I actually wind up, you know, pointing that a little bit later. But if the talent doesn't have an IFB or some kind of return where they're able to hear it, um, you need to re just remember that that microphone's pretty useless. All, the, all those mics are pretty useless if the talent isn't trained on how to cue that mic properly. So uh, take a look at that video, put a link in the chat and listen to the difference before I turn it and after I turn it because it makes a huge difference. Yeah. Good, Mitchell. Yeah, the other problem is that some people have this reflex that when you put a microphone in front of them, they grab it right out of your hand. So you have to be careful how you do it. And one other little uh, add-on, um, uh, an RF wireless mic pod that can pop on the bottom of it. Because sometimes you're in a real hurry, you can't mess with XLR cables. Yeah, I, I we use the electrosonic um, uh, inserts a lot, and they are amazing. Like, they just work every single time you turn them on, and and they um, they work great. And Sennheiser, Sennheiser makes them as well, and a couple other folks. But the, the electrosonics in this field uh, do really, really well. Uh, next question. Uh, it looks like Sletel Flil Gerswald, and I'm probably really messing up, sorry, in Tromso, Norway, says we generally do a test with all Zoom participants before a production. We help them fix their camera positioning, microphone background, and so forth. Any tips for such a checklist? Uh, go ahead, Chris. We've talked about this before in the past. I will say that when there's a panel of people that know each other, sometimes, only sometimes, it helps to do them together because you can be more efficient. And if they are uh, friendly with each other, they'll enjoy having a little time just to chat with each other. I'll also say that, um, uh, hold on real quick here. Let me just turn this thing off. Uh, I like to have the framer available to shove people underneath it because it's amazing how quickly they, they'll they start like, oh, look, oh, look, I should be sitting right about here. You know, um, and then when they do it together, there's a list in some groups, obviously some people you can't do it. There's a little bit of one upmanship, you know, those, those, they'll, they'll, they'll all kind of rise to the occasion when you push them toward being better a little bit. Go ahead, Jeffrey. Two terms that I always like to tell people, first of all, look at the low black void, try to uh, focus on the low black void. I know it's tough to do because I, I have that problem myself. And the second one is, how big of a book do you have? Uh, the biggest thing uh, for me is, you know, it doesn't matter if they're on a laptop or whatever. 
uh, you're always going to have to get the best shot. So you have to figure out uh, different ways to get them to boost up those cameras. And then uh, the other thing is never, 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 never tell them that they have bad equipment. They can say they have bad equipment, but you, you just never say, hey, you know, this is a piece of junk because it, it's, it, it, when they're getting ready to do a show, they don't want to think, oh, I'm just using this horrible camera now. Uh, let them say, oh, this is not a great thing. You say, I can make it work and then make it work. But then later on, you could definitely discuss what uh, they can do to, to make changes for their system for future videos. Yeah, go ahead, Mitchell. You know, to Chris's point, I understand the, the reason we have the Fenwick framer, but my old film school teaches me rule of thirds, and that should be a little bit like this or a little bit like this. Um, how do you deal with that uh, in a situation where it doesn't require a super source or something like that? Uh, in Zoom, we always center out. <laughs> like, it's just, it just is the zoom frame because we're going to do super sources like in our shows we're, we're doing super sources for everything and you know it's a straight i mean if you look at even the news it's everybody centered you know so so the um you know for that for that process and so uh, the, the the film approach for us when people take the film approach of going into the rule of thirds it's kind of a nightmare on our end we, we see we have people who do it and it makes us crazy because it's just it's you know especially you know there's because it does it's weird to be off to one frame and then looking straight into the camera um, we don't actually tell people to look at the, at the camera. We tell them to just, you know, we try to figure out, we, we suggest to them that they put themselves in zoom at the very top and make the window a little bit smaller so that they're just, they're right under their camera, you know, because the reality is, is that it's a better show when they are um, reacting to each other. So if they don't see each other, there's kind of this dead eye thing that happens because they're not actually, there's something that happens. We learned this when we were doing in Teratron. There's something that happens when people see each other that they respond. So they say, if someone nods, like one thing we have to tell, this took a long time. We had an interviewer who had a list of questions he wanted for the person. And he'd be looking down at the next question. He wanted to go as fast as he could. And so he'd ask the person the question through an interatron and then immediately look down and start looking for his next question while that person's answering, like whatever he's going to say, whatever he's going to say. And people got really stifled. Like they just, they felt like they, they're talking into actually feeling like they're not being listened to. And we told them, you have to sit there and look through that in Teraton and nod. Oh yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's great. Yeah. I just And treat the person like they're saying that, and you got a much entirely different interview, like an entirely different experience. So you want to be very careful of that. The, you know, for us, we've done about, I don't know, five or 6,000 people. Um, the big thing is, is that a lot of the same things don't, don't tell people that they're broke, <laughs> that their thing is broken. I, what I will say is that these days I send out some kind of kit. It can be a $50 kit or a $15,000 kit, but somebody's getting a kit if I'm going to do the show or you, I've like literally gotten to the habit of just turning people down. <laughs> like they're like, Oh, we don't want to send the kits out. And I'm like, oh, I'm the wrong person. Like, I don't want to do it. So, um, because it's just too much, too much hassle, you know? And, uh, so, but if we don't, if it, let's just say that there's an odd person we're bringing in that we don't have a kit for, we, um, number one is their internet, ethernet. Like they have to have ethernet. If we talk to someone ahead of time and they don't have ethernet, I call Amazon and I send them one. <laughs> like, like here, like how far away is your router? Oh, it's really far away. Uh, well, how far is that? 75 feet. Okay, we'll send you a hundred foot cable. Like, like, you know, like and we just send them the cable, you know, to make sure that they're connected to their router. Um, number two is audio. So how do we get the best audio out of them? Can you move things around in your, can you put up a blanket? Can you do something? And we just ask we're pretty, we ask for a lot, you know, like, like we don't, you know, because our job is to make sure that, and this is what I learned. We had a executive assistant that called and screamed at me for a half an hour the next day because her CEO didn't, didn't want to push too hard. Um, you know, the, the CEO was impatient with me and I backed away and I just said, okay, this is the way, you know, what it is. And then he looked horrible and sounded horrible in front of thousands of people. And I got an executive assistant calling me and, and just cussing me out for half an hour about, you know, it's your job to, you know, it's your job to do. And I said, well, he's a little impatient. He goes, yeah, he's impatient all the time. He's the CEO. He runs a billion dollar company. <laughs> like, like, you know, like, like that's like, you have to work through that. That was your job. That was your one job. You know, like, you know, it was, and I, it was a real eye opener for me. And after that, we pushed a lot harder. Not, we, you know, there is a point where you just go, that's as good as it's going to get. And you have to know where that point is. And that's an art. That's not, there's no technical aspect to that. So this is also why we also like to do these setups a day before or two days before, 
Um, now, opposed to Chris, I will never put people in. The first time I do a tech check with them, I'll never put them in a room with someone else because it creates a, a, a traumatic experience for some people because they just look, they feel like they, people hate to look silly. So you don't want to have them, you want to sort that out by themselves so they can handle it now. To Chris's point, the day of the event, I bring them in to do their final tech check after I've already fixed everything. And now they get to talk to each other and we tweak a couple little things and we push a little things. But the first time we talk to them, we want them by themselves. And then the... Um, uh, but we fix their internet, we fix their audio, we try to fix their lighting, we try to fix their camera, and then we try to fix their background. That is the list that we just, just that's the list that we work through because those are the, that's the order of importance in our opinion about how, how to work through it. Yeah, next question. Next one comes from Douglas Carmichael. And I think it relates to the show yesterday. How do you make sure your witness camera feed for a remote lighting designer is accurate? Go ahead, Bill. So Tlaloc uh, mentioned this yesterday when the second hour, when he was talking about uh, how, what happens when things go very wrong. And he told the story of a circumstance where he was remote controlling all the lighting in a live webcast and literally he lost total control and he could not see. He had no visual feedback. So he's moving lighting and he can't tell what's going on. So he was talking about a witness camera being set up somewhere. In that case, I think he pulled out an iPhone just to get some kind of feedback so the lighting designer who was making things happen could see what was happening. And he was talking about needing that to be as color accurate accurate as possible and as brightness accurate as possible so that that remote lighting designer could do their job. So I think that's the context of the question. Yeah, I, I think that, yeah, oh, go ahead, Guy. Yeah, thanks. Uh, the 5600K setting on a lot of the cameras, the daylight setting, um, will help you at least get in the ballpark. You, you also have on more sophisticated cameras, of course, LUTs and tint and all these uh, further adjustments. But uh, for witness cameras, a lot of times they're just going to be pretty basic. So as long as you can lock down, get out of auto white balance and lock down from 5600 or 5400K, because then the lights that are 3200K, which to our eyes will look, you know, an orangish, uh, more warm tone, those will appear to the far end viewer, um, you know, who's watching like Tololoc in Maryland and venues in San Francisco, he's going to see that light appearing as orange, which would be correct. So at least you're in the ballpark. So I would say at least just get locked down on daylight. And a lot of times, again, those witness cameras aren't going to be proper, you know, fully nice cameras are going to be pretty basic cameras. Yep. Next question. Uh, I Catch it all, Phil uh, Gurzwald again from Tromso says the never ending question How do you get presenters to hand in their presentations on time? If we crack this one, yeah. go ahead, Chris. Um, you can't, and they won't. Um, you can threaten them, but nobody likes to be threatened when they're paying you a bunch of money. The, the real answer to the problem is um, How do you have enough staff slash personnel to handle? the last minute ads, the last minute changes. And this is where it gets difficult when somebody says, well, we're going to have five presenters and they're all going to do their own slides. In your mind, your budget has to go kink, 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 kink. You know, because you're going to need one person on site to do nothing but massage new graphics that come in late. You're going to have, and you might have to have multiple people. And when people say, well, I don't understand why that's so expensive. That's that's the question you should be asking. How do I explain to somebody why this is so expensive when they have people providing their own graphics? Um, we were doing John's rocket launch a few weeks ago, and in the prep for it, uh, somebody brought up the idea of a credit roll. I go, well, that, that'll take a week. And somebody said, it's not going to take a week. I go, yes, it will. No, it won't. There was tons of mistakes. There was omissions. There were people that were... Uh, um, it won't, it won't uh, credited take a week. in a way that, it, it, that didn't it, do honor to what they it, gave. I mean, it it's really hard. It won't take a week. It'll only take a week to do it well. Yes. <laughs> and, 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 and that's why the old, that's why old guys like me get super grumpy because you young guys don't listen to me. Look, it's going to take a week. Trust me. It's going to take yeah. a week. Yeah. The, the, um, uh, someone asked, uh, uh, the, 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 what we do is, is, uh, the, I learned what, one of the things I learned, I spoke to it at, uh, I spoke about podcasting of all things in 2007 in WWDC, you know, in front of, a, I don't know, 50, like a, the big room, <laughs> like the big room there. And um, uh, Apple's pretty good at this thing. You you have to submit your outline six weeks in advance. And then there's a, they just have a meeting, a half an hour meeting with somebody every week. <laughs> so it's really hard to not 
have a progression that shows up because you just you have lots of deadlines, you know, to get things done. Now, you may not have that kind of scale and people may not jump through those hoops. But but if you set up weekly meetings, half an hour meetings, what it does is it creates a deadline for them to get a certain amount done. And people internally have a hard time not not doing that. You know, so it's something to kind of think about there. And one of the things that we tell people is if we get it in less than a week, um, there can't be any animations because we're just going to pump out a P, uh, JPEGs. So like, like, hey, we need to like integrate the stuff with what we're doing. It's totally fine for it to come in at the last minute. But if you do, it may not look like everybody else's. And it will also, um, we can, you can't have any animations. So I, you'd be surprised that people who are into, an, into this thing, they like, they get that done because they don't want to be stuck with stills. Now, some people don't care and then they put the stills in and that's fine. <laughs> but, you know, and it has typos and it has a whole bunch of things. So they can give it to us. But we, and, and then we do, for the larger events, we do exactly what Chris said is we have a team that, you know, sits there and and um, converts their PowerPoints to Keynote. <laughs> you know, so, so anyway, so that's like, unless they're at Microsoft and Google, uh, we'll convert everybody's PowerPoints to, key, key, to Keynote. Um, and, or if they do tons and tons of animations, but of course I didn't have to worry about that because they they bought it late. <laughs> so so they have tons and tons of animations. Um, you know, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Chris. Um, another solve for this is if you and this doesn't work in a Zoom in a Zoom you know virtual world, but if you're doing a show where you have a giant screen, and quite often you know I'm working on shows with you know, 10,000, 12,000, 15, 16,000 pixel wide screens. Right. And you design your presentations to maximize that screen, then there is an obvious transition point where somebody who's sitting at their little computer making a PowerPoint slide and you show them what it's gonna look like, you go, oh, I don't know how to do that. Yeah, that's what we do. So give us your presentation and we'll make it lovely for you. What, what's funny is, is that we often do that, but then it, like it might be an, a 32 by nine or, or even us, I've done ones that are like 64 by nine, you know, like really, really wide screens and we show them that. But the funny thing is, is that it's often the, the slides themselves are still 16 by nine somewhere on the screen. And the reason we do that is because we're streaming it. <laughs> like, like we can't like, you know, and then the handful of places where we break it apart we do a wide in the back. So there's a wide camera that captures that that experience because there's nowhere for us. To, otherwise, it'll be like this weird little thing, you know, in the middle. Yeah. And so you frame it up. But but yeah, you're absolutely right. And the big when they see that, that giant screen, they realize, oh, I have to I have to play well with others. And the big companies that are doing these are having I mean, there's teams that are working on these. And, you know, it, it's hard for us because when we're doing smaller shows, you know, we're not doing that. We don't have teams of working that are working on the presentation. But but it's a it's a it's an interesting thing. Yeah. And for those of you wondering, 32 by nine is two 16 by nines next to each other. Yeah, sorry, yeah, we think in 16 by nine, increments of 16 by nine, because that were the projectors. Um, you can get a lot more creative when you have uh, when you have LED walls, and you can get, make them all kinds of different shapes and stuff like that. And then the only, the only problem after that is all the array. All right, next question. TJ Asher's up next from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Birding with Lois premieres tonight. Who else is excited? And he's got a link there. Yeah, we're really excited to see this go. I mean, another great show coming out. Um, I'm getting ready to go. I haven't done it yet, but I'm getting ready to shoot uh, some video footage to send to Lois. I'm like, here's some, I have so many birds around where I live. And so I'm, I'm working on trying to shoot some so that I can send them uh, with a camera, shoot, shoot the birds with a camera, um, you know, uh, and um, and uh, send, send some photos, um, you know, or actually some video of it. So um, I think it's going to be really fun. So, and I can't wait until we start doing live ones, like live commentary. Uh, from the from the waters. All right, next question. Bo Cordell in Charleston, South Carolina is up next. Is anyone using Ross dashboard software for show control? Bo, I'm embarrassed to say that I've never heard of it before. <laughs> So I don't, I don't know if that's me being out of, out of control. I, uh, I, I'm now um, making a, a little list of what it looks like. Uh, you know, Ross makes a lot of great stuff, especially when it comes to, you know, we've seen a lot of um, kind of events being built uh, around a lot of the Ross technologies, but um, this is not something I'm familiar with. It, and I would say that, Bo, if you know, but if you know anyone over at Ross that might be able to, uh, come join us and show us how it works for a second hour. I'd love to have that on the second hour. It looks really cool. So uh, let us know. All right, next question. 
Jesse Mills, our friend from the San Francisco Bay Area, says, has anyone used the Zoom recording connector? This is a method that relies on on-prem meeting connector and a server for recording. Would the look or contents of a recording connector match record to cloud or record local, he wonders? Um, I think it will be, it'll match record local. Um, I don't think it'll match, I mean, record to cloud is not very good. <laughs> so, so it's, 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 a, it's, a, I think record to cloud is limited to 720p. Um, and so I think it'll be better than that uh, for record local. I think that usually these uh, local, local reflectors are um, really designed around being able to either have security or um, not have internet, um, uh, you know, not pinch the internet. If you have a thousand people going to it, you want them on the internal network. So I don't think that the recording itself will be any better. I think it's just that it, it reduces the load on the, either reduces the load or increases the security of the event. Uh, next question. Comes from Douglas Carmichael, longtime questioner here. He says, I'm deciding between a Master of the Arts course in music composition, sound design for media or an iOS development course. I've been producing electronic music for seven years and love it. Many co positive comments about my work, but which would be more marketable? He's wondering. Mitchell. They have a saying in uh, golf, it's uh, driving's for show and putting's for dough. iOS is your dough. It's going to enable you to be able to do a lot of things, including spending the time learning about music. Because music is a muse and it satisfies uh, a different part of your brain than the iOS part, which is going to satisfy your bank account. <laughs> a different part of your brain, you know, the one that's trying to pay bills. Uh, anyway, go ahead, Jeffrey. Uh, I wouldn't worry about what you wh where you're going to get it. I'd worry more about if you're understanding from the place that you're going to get it, because ultimately, it's going to be your skills that's going to sell your uh, sell your product. And it's not going to be where your fancy degrees or anything like that are from. So uh, work uh, if if iOS is where you're you're clicking on, then go iOS. If, if this uh, MA is is where where it's going to get you to take it to the next level, then do that. Yeah, I I always encourage people to do what they love because I don't, I'm not very good at doing stuff. I don't, I'm not interested in for very long. <laughs> like I, I'm just not, it's not one of my, I have a lot of capabilities. That's not one of them. Um, so, uh, so it's, uh, so I, I, I think that, um, you definitely want to look at what you love at the same time. I will say on the surface, uh, Mitchell's right that the, on the surface right now, being a pro iOS programmer is a safer bet than, um, getting a music degree. Um, but I would say that if you love doing music, if you're great at Look, if you're great at what you do and you're really focused on it and you practice it and you get good at it, you can be successful in anything. But but I just know, I know, um, I know a lot of iOS engineers who wrote an app and never have to work again. And I know a lot of artists that are concert level, stunning and amazing that are still trying to make you know scratch out a living. And that's the that's the thing is that if you're um, you know, that's in the current environment, unfortunately, uh, a programmer is, you know, especially one that can, you know, work from anywhere, work by themselves or with people and build applications. Um, you have probably a higher percentage chance of making a living if that's what you're working on. Um, but uh, uh, but it, it, it's just an enormous, like becoming great at, at music is, I listen to my kids. My son plays violin. My daughter plays everything. <laughs> and I just listen to my kids. Uh, practice and I'm just like so much time that it takes to become good at it and they're starting to get good at it I you know what's funny is I love listening to them learn like my son you know people say oh violin is horrible if someone doesn't know what they're doing my son was self-conscious about it I'm like I don't care like I just love listening to the effort you know that's what I all I hear with my son working on it or my daughter doing things over and over again is just listening to the effort and I think that the the effort in a creative area is is a beautiful sound go ahead Chris yeah, we were talking about this a little bit last night on comms. Uh, the music industry is is super hard, like you're saying. And I and I was saying that on every video crew I've ever worked on, you know, as long as you know it's, it's not a small group, you can always put together a band. You know, camera three. Oh, I used to play drums. Uh, audio. Yeah, I played bass. You know, actually, audio probably played guitar. But I mean, everybody has. A music. Everybody has a musical background, and I was I was joking about it last night. I go, the difference is, we figured out how to make money, <laughs> and so we got out of music because music yeah. is too hard. It's super well, hard. And by the way, I mean that's one of the reasons that I'm building stages like what I'm building is trying to increase the opportunity. You know, so that people that great people can get out to more people easy more easily. 
you know, and so I, and I'm really excited when people are willing to play with my crazy idea because it's, it could change, you know, it could change a lot of things for a lot of artists if we figure it out, you know, uh, go ahead, Ken. Well, I agree that uh, sustained practice is uh, an excellent idea, although there's something a little disconcerting about a clarinet squeak, but as long as it continues, you can see that there's progress involved in it. He mentions specifically, though, that uh, music composition or sound design for media. And I wonder if there might be a niche set of skills that yeah, could be brought to bear uh, for producing startling Atmos playbacks of some kind of music composition. What do you think? How do you think? Yeah, those I think that together? I think that an Atmos or some kind of immersive sound design is probably a better place to go. But what I will say is you're playing with some heavy hitters like these, the, the folks that we use that are not very expensive. Like I, you know, and that's the, that's the hard part is that, is that the people who are doing compositions, like I, you know, I've hired a lot of people to build a composition for me and it's, and I don't even know how they do it for $5,000 or $3,000 or $8,000. I'm like, I don't know how they made something so amazing. Maybe they're just that good and they just put, push it out. But I just, you know, um, the, the hard part is, is that because because people start when they're young, and this is a problem in our education system, is that we give people generalized education till they're 18. We take the most valuable brain time that they have, and we waste it on stuff that they'll never remember, you know, 10 years later. And um, instead of letting them specialize, you know, in things that they love to do. And some kids will join band, and they'll do their thing, and they will specialize. So the reason that that's important is they, you know, every year under 18 is worth two years in the rest of the world, right? And so the thing is, is that you have time, you don't have cash pressure, some, some of you don't, um, but you can sit there and a lot of these instruments are relatively inexpensive to buy something that you can, you know, scratch out. So, you know, 10 years before 18 is like 20 years after 18, you know, that you get to spend on this stuff and, and, and just the amount of information that you can pick up. And so the people that you're competing with started when they were six or seven or eight or nine years old. And they have in a like they when they're 20 years old, you know, getting into it after that. I'm not saying that you can't do it. I had a friend that became concert level pianist and he started at 40, but it did take him 20 years. <laughs> like, like it was like, you know, like it was a practice to do it. And and it's um, so it's a very difficult thing to take. There are certain things that, you know, I'm never going to be a quarterback. I always want to be a quarterback. I'm never going to be a quarterback. I'm too short too small you know and um and so and there's a lot of things that i would love to to do i've thought oh this is something i would do and i you have to get to some point where you go that's not one of the things i'm going to do and and um and i think that you know getting into instruments for fun and for enjoyment um after you know at, at a certain age is great um but i'm just saying it's an uphill battle like it's just you're 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 playing against the odds and it doesn't mean that you can't win it doesn't mean that you can't do it with enough focus and effort, but you just need to know that you're 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 running up a hill with wind, you know, and some wild animals. Um, go ahead, uh, Mitchell. I used to deal with this dilemma all the time when I was uh, in radio and I was a music director at a radio station, and I had people saying, uh, "My my son Johnny is you know he's kudos number one in this class on the saxophone or guitar." or whatever else. And the answer was always the same. Just being really good at what you do musically is a, is a prerequisite to be considered. Everything else is sometimes led to led up to change or uh, chance. Uh, you don't always say, have control over it. I wouldn't say chance, but I would say dedication and the ability to work with other people and the ability to see opportunities and the willingness to do what it takes to win. You know, like I think that, that there is a, there's kind of a, a thing that on top of being really, really good at what you do. But yeah, you're right that in, in the world of music, being really, really good is table stakes. <laughs> like, like, you know, there's people on the street that play guitar amazingly well, and they're asking for change, you know, and I am very committed to changing that. You know, that's what, what, what a big piece of what I work on is trying to create new opportunities and open that up. But, but you need to know that it's, you know, there's a lot of incredible people that are playing incredible music you know, out there. And we, we want to find that. We want to empower them. Um, but it's in the current environment, it's a challenge. Um, next question. Douglas Carmichael's up next. And he says, when you're working with a large lighting system in a large theater or arena slash stadium, how do you build smaller groupings of instruments to make programming easier? I think you might have asked the wrong, at the wrong time. We don't, I don't think we have the people that are 
Um, I think that that's, that might even be a, um, a Tlaloc question. We'll have to wait until you see Tlaloc here. So you just eventually what we're going to do is we're going to invite everybody and then we'll post who's going to be there so you can think about questions for specific people. But uh, but if you see Tlaloc in the, after, in the after hours too, that might be good. Uh, he is the master. I got to say, we were just doing the show with him last night. He's just such an artist. Just so great to have him talk about it earlier in the day and then just show what he could do in the evening. It was amazing. Next question. Next question comes from Harshid in Daytona Beach, Florida. Speaking of Sennheiser, have you heard of any new products from them? Uh, go ahead, Guy. Yeah, these were the uh, in-ear monitors that we couldn't talk about the other day. What I was saying, hold up, don't don't buy anything if you're in that space. It looks like it's um, um, four hundred. Uh, what, what are they? Four, what's the? What are they called? The Sennheiser. Uh, da, 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 da. XS IEM, XSW IEM, and uh, they're rack mountable, so you can do like stacks of them. So if you are doing, uh, let's see, where is that picture I just saw? There's like four of them in, in a row there. Um, I'm not sure what else is really the the, the big uh, selling points. I haven't studied this yet. What's to the be honest What's with the you. cost? Five ninety nine. So five ninety nine per channel. Yeah. And they're in, they're in the 400 to 500 megahertz range is the uh, frequencies. It's hard to find it on their website. It's like it's not. It's not it... on there. Yeah, it's not on really? there. That's yeah. <laughs> I don't know why. I, this is Sennheiser marketing material that for dealers that I'm looking at right so now. Sec, se, um, Sennheiser XS IEM. Yeah, so XSW IEM. And actually, it looks like there is a. So the variants are A, B, C. E and K. So there is 400, uh, 476 to 500 megahertz, 572, then 662. So, and then E looks like, I think that's a broad E and K. I believe those are both uh, frequencies in and the, are, uh, the UK. Are, are they shipping? Uh, we ordered some for pre-order. So I, I didn't see them arrive within the last couple of days, but it said they're taking pre-orders. So I think that they're either on the way or they'll be out shortly. That's great. That's great. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, I was talking to somebody once years ago about in-ear monitors, and they said, just remember, you're putting concert-level sound in your ear canal. Don't buy something cheap. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. the last thing you want to do is go cheap in your ear canal. Yeah, Too late. Yeah, it... <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, it's... it's uh, um, and I would say that yeah, the five hundred dollar range is about if you're doing anything for concerts or anything else. Uh, there's a couple of them. The Me Pro is the one that we've used in a couple of the shows that I've worked on that are about the same uh, same range in cost. Um, and uh, anything less, I haven't heard anything less that I would put in a musician's ear. Like I wouldn't, I haven't heard of any in ear monitors less than five hundred dollars a channel that are uh, worth putting in a musician's ear if they're playing. In my opinion. Um, so I, I'm really excited about the Sennheisers. As soon as they start shipping, I'm going to buy some. So anyway, uh, next question. David Paskin, Miami, Florida here on the panel. Oh, poor David. I'm having trouble finding my Apple TV remote. Apple TV remote is requiring a passcode on my Apple TV, but I can't find the remote. Help. Go ahead, Chris. One, David, you can buy new ones. Uh, it's a bummer. Also, on your iPhone, if you go into the control center, you can turn on the option of a Apple TV remote in your, um, when you swipe down from the upper right-hand corner, and you can, no, you're saying no, okay. For those of you watching, you can't see David in the panel shaking his head saying, you don't know what okay. you're about. We'll jump, to, uh, this is going to be confusing for our editors, but we'll jump, David, can you explain a little bit more what, what, what we're no, doing the, here? No, the, the problem is, is that I have that, but it's requiring me to enter a code on the Apple TV for which I need an Apple remote. You can't, uh, you can't enter it with the phone. The phone has no. an input. This no. is a ploy to get you a buy, get you to buy a new Apple TV. <laughs> Cause I've lost my remote in the past and I've, I've just switched Tim over Cook to my phone. Again. I just, I just switch over to my phone until I, uh, until I find the, the Apple remote, which is usually it's, it's invariably somewhere Sofa in the couch. Cushion. It's somewhere in the couch. Like just, you know, you're going to have to, like, I found it in lots of places, but it's always somewhere in the couch, you know, like it's, it's, uh, you know, it's like. <laughs> It's, it can, it, sometimes it falls through, you know, the little fabric underneath the cushion. Sometimes it falls through that and it's sitting in the, I have one where it was kind of sitting 
cata cata in, in the in the spring, but it's it's there. It's there. Just just know that it's it's there. The one thing I don't understand is I would happily pay ten dollars more for my Apple TV if it just made a noise. <laughs> like like you have little trackers. I felt like I should like tape a tracker to the to the thing because we lose it all the time because my you know everyone sets sets it down somewhere um, and uh, we find it relatively quickly. But I'm like why does the remote not make noise? Like, oh, you have all these little things that make noise. Um, it needs to make noise, yeah. <laughs> and it needs to have like an ultra wide band so it can just have the little arrow that points to where it is. I mean, that would be life changing. I don't know. Some, I love Apple, but there's some things that I feel like are so obvious. <laughs> Find my remote. Or what? Or what you show up on? You you're missing. Point. You're missing the Apple incremental sales ploy. They want you to buy an AirTag to put on your remote. So that you can find the remote with the AirTag. <laughs> I will say I love AirTags. Like they're they're magical because they they pick up on everybody else's Wi-Fi. So it's like anytime someone walks by, I've found lots of things and you know with AirTags to connect it to them. I'm good, Bill. Well, that that, uh, that was my point. Yeah. I was I just thought I'd do it in line. Yeah, go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, if they put a big arrow on it to tell you which side was up and which is down, it would save me in a darkened room. <laughs> Which, which one, right. And then sometimes I throw it when I get upset, and then it's lost. Throw it! Don't throw the my my, my nephew threw the Steelers did a bad play, and he threw it at at the TV and broke it. Just in case you're wondering, it will break the TV if you throw it hard enough. <laughs> like it, it was it was a bad it was a bad scene. They couldn't watch the rest of the game. I, I only know because they all came over to my parents' house when I happened to be there because the TV was. I won't let my family buy a Wii because of that. <laughs> no, you're not going to get a Wii. The quest is a little like that too. Like my my kids have like gone over the couch and other things like playing playing uh, uh, quest games. So Oculus. Uh, all right, we are now changing subjects, and uh, I got to figure out that cue. So because I go, and now, and that's the cue to, to go black. <laughs> so we'll figure it out. We'll figure we'll figure that part. That for those watching, you know, we're always working on like how to make some of this stuff work smoother and uh, we're still working on it. So anyway, um, so we're changing subjects. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, um, run of show. And and so the, the thing is, is that it's a, you know, run in for the panelists, you can throw some stuff in if you want to give your two cents, but we can talk a lot about technology and the tech of doing these things. But I think a lot of people as someone who works on run of shows all the time, I think a lot of people forget that that run of show is going to really define your show. <laughs> like it's going to, it is, you know, and, and there's little things and you have to read through them to what, what's going to happen. Um, so like so, sometimes someone will go, so first of all, you have a run of show and you have to look at technically, can I do what they're asking me to do? Like, do I have the equipment to do it? Because someone who doesn't know what they're doing, like doesn't know production will do something that on paper looks simple. Oh, I'm going to cut to this window. I'm going to cut to this video and then I'm going to talk and then I'm going to cut to this video and then I'm going to talk and then I'm going to have this person come in and that all, you know, yeah, it all makes sense. But there, you know, I'm cutting to a person that, you know, and that there's got to be a camera over there and there's got to be this over here and there's got to be audio for that. And then there's, are we, where are we playing to? Are we playing to two different venues? Are we doing this or, you know, and so you have, so little things on paper can become very complicated in the run of show. And so beyond just, uh, the creative, which we'll talk about today as well, you have to technically really visualize what that actually means. You know, when we say that we're going to do this thing, what does that actually mean? Um, now our run of shows, a lot of times are thinking about, now there's, there is a technical TikTok, which is what we tend to call it before TikTok, um, is, you know, all day, like what, what are we doing? What needs to be done? But then there's the run of show and that for us, the run of show generally starts about 20 minutes to half an hour before the show because that's part of the show <laughs> like you know like so the 20 minutes or 30 minutes before the show in person out of so usually that and that usually coincides when i used to do so 30 years ago i was doing physical events and i did a couple hundred of those before we did anything virtual and so for us that run of show is when we open the doors doors open at you know and now the sh that's the show the show is when the doors open everything else up until then you're prepping and then after that but everything's a show like everything because how people feel this is the same in physical as it is in in uh in virtual how people feel when you start the show changes how they their impression of the show you know and how comfortable they are so we would be like when we we're doing physical events it was what is the temperature what is the music what is the lighting like 
how are we encouraging people to sit in the front most centermost seat? <laughs> like, like if you're doing a seminar, there was a lot of uh, getting people to find the front most centermost seat. Um, so uh, uh, how do we do all of these, these bits and pieces that have people feel really comfortable? They feel calm. They feel excited or excited about what they're about to do. Um, things are taken care of, you know, those are kind, those kinds of things. In the same way, when we do virtual, we have to think about those things. And um, so in the pre-show, we're thinking about, you know, what, you know, whether there's, there's a couple different ways in a pre-show to work. You have a still, that's the worst. <laughs> By the way, like putting up a still before your show is like devastating, um, you know, to your show. Um, putting up a countdown clock is the second, you know, it's, it's better than nothing. That's what we do here just because we just haven't had time, but we let people talk underneath it, which is a little bit of a show, like on, on sometimes a good show and sometimes not a good show, but, but it, it is a, it, it, that five minutes of when we go live, it's still a sh us talking under the countdown clock is part of the show, you know, and, and it is, um, and so it, it cause it will create, it will increase, um, it, it will increase dwell time. You know, people will get there and there's, they feel like something's going on. After that, we do videos. We do, you know, we play a video out. You have videos that are going to play a hodgepodge of them. Sometimes it's a couple of videos and then a, a clock to tell people what to expect and then go back to videos. And so you, you have something there and that'll also, that's, that's better than the countdown clock and much better than a still. And then after that, we have a pre-show and a pre-show is the best. <laughs> like pre-show is the, the best way to do this is that people are going to come in. There's things going on. People are happy. They're excited. They're doing their thing. Um, and so uh, that gets the crowd going. And if you go to David Letterman, you go to Jimmy Fallon or whatever, there's a pre-show. There's a comedian that comes out and tells you stories. There's there's people that tell you how important you are to the show. There's, uh, you know, the, oftentimes the the host will come out and talk to you for a little while. So that, that's part of their run of show. Like that is part of their run of show is to, to get ready before the show, you know, to do those things. And then the other thing is, is that, you know, with anything else, um, you know, what is your infill and what is your exfill? <laughs> like, how are you going to get into the show and how are you going to get out of the show? A lot of the shows themselves are not super technical. Like uh, they can be, but they're, but a lot of the kind of shows that we do aren't super technical, but understanding how you're going to start the show. Like I, I was talking about, it. I did a show yesterday, but we rehearsed the open somewhere between 10 and 20 times. I don't remember exactly, but it was somewhere between 10 and 20, just the open. Like we got through a little bit of the other parts, but I need to know how I, you cannot underestimate how powerful it is to have a show start well and how devastating it is to have it show. If a show goes off the rails at the very beginning of the show, you're going to, um, uh, you know, it's very hard for talent to recover. Like they just get into their head. You know, the, 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 there's mistakes start being made by the talent, by your technical staff. You've got clients that are upset. You've got all this other stuff. And so you, you, when, you, and the reason I talk about it and run a show, this is partially production. But when you talk about run of show is you want to look at what is it going to take in that run of show to open well, you know, and how are we going to, you know, set up a cadence that is going to open well, because it's super important to get into the show uh, without any, any um, major sharp edges. And so when you look at run of shows, you want to think about that. Um, and then, and then at that point, you know, as you start to do these run of shows, you just really need to know the main, you know, the main points. I think the other side of this is too much in the run of show. Like people want to plan everything and some of it's just letting things happen you know, letting discussion happen. Um, you know, people over script in their run of shows as well. This is a, a typical thing that people don't, who don't do a lot of shows um, want to put like script up out everything. Um, I am not a big fan of, for instance, teleprompting <laughs> you know, or even having a script like that, um, you know, for shows. Uh, if you have a great actor who knows what they're doing and you have a great operator like Courtney, um, then there's, that's one thing. But Oftentimes we don't have those. Uh, we don't have people who do teleprompting all the time. We don't have teleprompter. You know, we can get teleprompter operators that are good, but the the point is, is that it feels very stale, you know. And then, or you have people looking down at note cards, and it's not not a great experience. So, yeah, go ahead, Chris. Speaking of teleprompting, a friend of mine has been known to fly with Tim Cook on the Apple private jet because he's that good of a teleprompter for Tim. Um, uh, you were talking about things that are possible or not possible. Um, there's a great lesson to be learned if you watch the behind the scenes elements of the show Studio 60 on the Sunset Strip. Now it's a different type of show. It's a, it's the behind the scenes of a evening sketch comedy show, but Timothy Busfield plays the director Cal in that show. And it is a, in my opinion, a very realistic depiction of what the director 
in a show like that has to do. They have a limited space. In other words, limited resources. We might be limited in how many super sources we have, et cetera. He has limited space. He has an ambitious producer who always wants to throw stuff at us. Clients always want to throw stuff at, at us. And he has to figure out, sometimes during rehearsals, it was like, okay, never mind putting that sketch over there. Let's put it over here in this hallway and we'll move camera. I'll move camera three during the commercial break or whatever. And literally in some of the rehearsals that they're showing in the show, there's cameras pushing right through scenes because it doesn't matter. It's a rehearsal because he's not only rehearsing the talent, but he's rehearsing all of the elements of the crew and will, can the cameras be in the right place at the right time? It's, I find it fascinating and it's a great look at, and it's a good analogy of managing the requirements of a client and the capabilities of the crew and not just people like, can you push those buttons fast enough, but do I have enough buttons to push? Yeah. And, and what I will say is that what goes into the run of show also is rehearsal, you know, like the rehearsal is super important. A lot of people are like, okay, we'll get this all working and then we'll go. And I will usually have, um, for in a pre-pro to go through the run of show, I will have three hours minimum for a same day, like for a simple show, like 20 minutes, 30 minutes long, three hours of rehearsal minimum, and usually five to six hours of rehearsal. And I think that people who don't do production at a high level. Now I admit that, you know, 95% of my work in the last decade has been fortune five or fortune 10. <laughs> like it's, it's not like I'm used to having the budget and time and people that you can have a bunch of people doing those things. And you're used to just that, that because in all shows, when you're working on run, when you're working on the run of show, when you're working on all the bits and pieces that you want to consider that the most expensive part of every event is failure. You know, like that is the thing that you're, you know, just, and there's first, the first level you can get create, you, it can be not as creative as you wished, but you can't fail. Like you, you, you know, and what you want to do is have things that the client doesn't obviously understand. Like none of our shows work out the way they work in our head. <laughs> like, you know, like not always, not, not very often. Uh, usually they're always a little like, oh, we could have done better there. We could have cut this a little faster. We could have done this, but you just don't want anything like miscues and so on and so forth. And that's why the rehearsals are so important, but that's why the run of show is important. You work through run of shows, you talk through them, you figure out what, you know, what is it going to actually technically take? And then when you get on set, all that rehearsal time, now the way we redo rehearsal just to go through the run of show is it was, we were talking about this a little earlier. I bring in actors because I don't want to go through the run of show with the talent because the talent will get impatient and they'll remember how much of a pain in the neck this was, you know, and they'll, you know, cause we're not, the first time we go through the run of show, we're tech, it's a technical blocking session. It is not a, um, it's not, we're not trying to figure out, we're not trying to have the talent figure out how to do this. We're trying to figure out how to do it. And so, so we want, we want the, we want the actors to be up there and we want them to, you know, we get, we just hire day actors for four hours or eight hours or whatever. It's not the same to cut to, to chairs. Like it's not like you're not, because you're gonna say, oh, I don't really the have that angle. Headroom gets all messed up. Headroom, exactly. <laughs> so, but but the, you know, the, the thing is, is that we work through that run of show and we go, we find the little edges. Okay, let's shave that off. Let's do this. Now we have it, do, 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 you know, working and then we, then we add the mo the moderator. Usually, you, we don't even want to add because sometimes we don't even get access to the talent. Like the talent is too important for us. They're you know they're going to be you know or whatever. If it's a corporate event like a keynote, we will get access to them, but we'll only get access to them for a little while. And man, if we don't get it right, it's going to be ugly. <laughs> you know, like it's going to be like like people are going to be upset. So um, because it, it you know so we want it to be technically totally clean before they come in. But that again comes back to that run of show, comes back to rehearsal, comes back to pre preparing for those things to make sure that you're, um, you have the best uh, chance of success and Chris, your mic's open. Um, let's go ahead and jump into the questions. Oh, you gonna, gonna say something? I was gonna say one last thing, sorry. Uh, you know, we talk about doing a run through, quite often my first walk through, uh, I, I call it a stumble through. Look, yep. we're, we're all on comms, can we all hear each other? Okay, everything's gonna be bad. Let's st Let's stumble through this thing. You know, this is where you're going to roll it. So don't walk away. This is, you know, uh, but I like that terminology, a stumble through. Yeah, yeah. We're going to, 
oftentimes we, we call it fail through the first run, you know, going to fail through the first run, run through, um, you know, just to, again, it's just figuring out which way is up. Um, let's go to the, let's go to the next question. David Brady in New York City says, at what point will you lock changes to a run a show and how can you get clients and or business units to get their stuff in in a timely fashion? Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, we talked about this in the first hour. Um, you you probably won't be able to, so you have to be, it, let's face it, these people are paying you a lot of money to do this and they really don't want you to say, I need more time, I don't have enough time, I, I, it can't be done. So you just have to staff up, you have to have enough people to deal with, with the last minute changes. And that's why you're a professional, because you know it's gonna happen. Hey, go ahead, Noah. Noah's not here, all right, go ahead, Bill. So I've done a couple of things where the runner shows were unusual and, and they, they fit what we were doing. And I'll talk just about a, 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 maybe two or three of them. One was the weirdest one I ever had. And I was announcing, I was one of the announcers because I was on radio at the time for a kind of a small local parade in the city of Cave Creek, Arizona. And so they sent out the run a show and it was really great because it had, here's the next band or here's the next marching drill team or whatever it was. And these are all local. And um, here's some information about them. And then the parade starts. And I realized that almost none of the information was going to be in order because this is a ill put together local thing and you're just trying to figure out it, which block am I even going to in my eyes and my point here is that sometimes you just have to not demand perfection out of something that is not going to be run that tight now on the other extreme of that I've had complex really well managed run of shows where I've been an announcer on something and literally they are depending on you to get your cues to the second and be ultimately professional and never miss a cue and know exactly when to fit in at that point one of the most critical things in my experience is knowing who you look to for your cue because I had circumstances where I showed up to do that and the floor director is who should have been giving me my cue but I'd look over and the producer was going do the VO do the VO and you have to learn to be tough enough to go, no, I'm not taking my cue from you. They told me to take my cue from him or her the floor director and that's it I'm gonna shut everything else down the last one was probably the most interesting because we sat right next to a camera operator at the Tonight Show decades ago, and um, they were nice enough to hand the run of show list that the Tonight Show used. I think it was Johnny Carson, David Steinberg was the guest, and it was the simplest piece of paper I have ever seen. I mean, it was literally just like 14 lines on a piece of white paper. And I realized the reason it was so simple is because they do it every single day. They have absolute peruse and they don't need to over explain anything. You get to that level where everybody just knows their job and you know they're going to hit everything they need to hit right on time. It gets simpler, not more complex. So those are just some thoughts. We tell, I, I, oftentimes in meetings, I tell jokes, you know, like that, that are, that are pointed, <laughs> like, like they're, they're like, you know, like, oh, we can, you know, we're running out of time and, you know, you rush a, you know, I'll just say, you know, you rush a miracle worker, you get rotten miracles. <laughs> like, you know, like, you know, a little, little princess bride for them. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll say little things like that. And they're not effective the first time, but they get effective over time. You know, so the thing that little quips that are not mean, but just funny from some movie or something, everyone laughs a little bit. Um, get them thinking about it, you know? And so we, you know, I, I, I often think in, you know, very long curves and that, you know, we'll, we'll keep on having a conversation about this and we'll keep on talking about it and we'll, and we'll say, well, we need a little more, you know, like at the end of when you're talking about it and they said, well, it was a little rough. And I was like, well, yeah, we need it. You know, we need a little more time on the run of show, you know, to make that happen. Uh, when does it finalize? I would say that the, uh, I've never seen a run of show finalized more than two hours before the event, you know, like to be the, the truly like, this is what we're going to do. Um, now we are 99% there usually before we get on site. Um, but the rehearsal drives the run of show at that point, you know, so there's kind of like, you know, there's the, I don't know what they, I can't remember the thing, but with movies, they say there's the movie you wrote, there's the movie you shot, there's the movie you edited, you know, like that, 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 that goes out and there are three different movies, you know, and I think that for us, that's very much the same. Like there is a, you know, what we did in, you know, when we were thinking about it, you want to be flexible enough to say, this isn't working with what we actually have here. And let's figure out how to make adjustments to that. But that's why that rehearsal time is so, you know, is so important is to have plenty of time to just casually work through these things and figure out the blocking and 
figure out the bits and pieces. And, you know, and we've had some pretty dramatic ones. We had an executive one time walk in to Moscone with 15,000, there's gonna be 15,000 people the next day. And um, maybe it was two days, and it was, it was gonna be rehearsals the next day, but he walked in, stood on the stage and said, stage is too short. We need to extend it 15. This is six o'clock in the evening. By tomorrow morning, we need, we need the stage to be 15 feet deep, deeper. And we were like, I wasn't like this. It wasn't my job, but I just listened to it. The, the production company was like, well, that's going to cost $400,000. He goes, okay. <laughs> so like, like, you know, it's like, and, and they just overnight, there's a whole bunch of you, you local 16. It was a, uh, it was a magical time for them. And, and they all came in and stage was deeper the next day. And again, the reason I bring that up is because as you work through these, the more you, you, you'll never have enough time. You'll never have enough time to do this. You'll just, you'll, you'll never have the perfect show. You'll just run out of time before you, you know, and this is the best we're going to do today, you know? And so the other thing that I will say is that, um, putting people in a constraint that says after this point in time, we can't add anything major to it. Like, and, and you know, we used to say a lot of times, we still say in the meetings, no, no new good ideas, <laughs> like, like no new good ideas. Like you get to a point and you run a show, like you're getting too close and you go, you can't, we can add that idea on the next show, but we can't do it on the show because we don't have the money. We don't have the prep. We don't have the things. We don't know the, and so people, what we try to understand, you know, have people, our clients understand is that as that run of show runs late, there are just less things we can do. Like, you know, it's just like to do, and again, you can do anything, but it takes time to do it well. <laughs> so, you know, and time is never, uh, you know, never on your side. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, it's interesting. I really think that there is a, um, there's like a genetic disposition for some people that they, and unfortunately these people, or maybe it's the reason why these people end up being executives in big companies, but there's a genetic disposition to push harder regardless. Like even if things are going great, everything's smooth, we're gonna have a great show in the morning, hmm, what else could we potentially break? Or in their mind, they're going to make it better. And I, and it's really interesting. I've seen it happen so many times. It's like, can you just leave everything alone? We're, we're set up to have a really good show here and you want to add 15 feet to the stage. I mean, come on. The, I, I think that they, you know, the, the thing we have to understand is that some people like, in this case, it was a marketing officer that was really he's the best in the world at what he does. You know, like it was, and he artistically could see what he wanted to change. You're absolutely right that it throws it off. And a lot of times I set pins in the wall of like, it's like when you're climbing, <laughs> drive a pin into the wall. I set pins like, if we do this, it could destabilize the event. Like that's that's the thing, or it'll put the event at risk is something that I will say often. Like, and I'll, I'm the first person that will say, we should just pull this out of the, out of the event. Um, because, uh, you know, like I'll pull things, I will pull my, you'll see me pull my elbows in. If we're having any technical problems, I'll just pull in and I'm like, don't have mistakes. Like that's the big thing that I, you know, don't have clear and obvious mistakes to the audience. Um, you know, as opposed to being as creative as I could be, you know, in that, in that process. And if things aren't going well, I'll definitely pull in, you know, in that, in that process. Um, but, but again, these runs of show makes a big difference in tech, having your tech people in it. Like a lot of times I get a run of show after they've had six meetings and they've already decided we have to do it this way. And I'm like, okay, well, but that's complicated. <laughs> you know, like, like that's a, that's a hard, hard thing to do. And uh, it looked good on paper, but it's, it's hard to do. Um, and, uh, and it requires a lot of heavy pivoting. And then that also drives your rehearsal time, you know, so yeah, next question. Uh, Jettelflar Griswold again from Thompson, Norway, and I'm probably mispronouncing that. How much time before somebody goes on stage, should they be mic'd and ready? Uh, usually I would say a minimum of, uh, I would say, I would try to do it 15 minutes out. Yeah. Um, you know, like 15 minutes is usually what we do. And it, and some of this also depends on the quality of your, uh, of your A2, you know, like, so you should not, when it comes to mics, do not underestimate the importance of your A2. Your A1 is the person sitting at the, at the mixing board. The A2 is the one putting the mics on and there's a way to do that. <laughs> and the A2 is the one that makes that happen and do not do shows without an A2. <laughs> like, like, you know, like if you're doing a live show, you need an A1 and you need an A2. 
you know, and, and because there's nothing worse than your A1 running away from the desk in rehearsals or whatever to mic somebody up. You need somebody who knows how to do that. And there is a process to organizing the wireless, to making sure that they're named. A lot of times they're taping the the, the table so they know who, and they know who's going to get each one of these things. And, and especially in COVID, and there's now like, how, how is it getting, you have an extra person that's just wiping everything down and making all that stuff. And a lot of times now we just get enough mics that no one has to use somebody else's mic. Um, but the, uh, but anyway, so there's this whole process that is um, uh, that needs to be uh, kind of managed. Um, it, you can definitely do it a, a minute out, but really to get everything just right with it, it does take at least five minutes. And then that's why I want them to start. 50, I want them to show up to be mic'd 15 minutes ahead of time. And then and then we get them mic'd and we want to make sure that they're standing around. The other thing you always want to be conscious of is once you mic them. I, I know this sounds like an obvious thing, but just make sure the mic's down. You know, like we've had stuff leak into the stage that we were like, mm. and you know, like that. I don't think we needed to do that. Um, go ahead, Chris. Yeah, the other thing is, like, listen to your crew. Listen to what the A2 wants. And and it's really easy to, to put, you know, a lav on a tie, but miking, you know, a woman with a very, you know, flowery, you know, flowy dress could be very difficult. So, you know, you never know. So g give the people the time that they want. It's it, one of the things that's interesting is, is that there's a lot of tools and a lot of things that, that for some reason we skimp on because we don't have the money or we don't have the whatever. And you're paying this person, the A2, let's say you're paying them 400, 500, 600, $800 a day. And then you don't want to pay $50 to have a cup, have a, have a good overhead light. <laughs> you know, like, 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 there's like, you know, like, like there's, you know, so, so you have to think about the, the one thing that, and, and I can't say that I do this, you know, their life's productions are imperfect. But as much as I can, I try to figure out how do we give within the budget that I have, how do I give the crew what they need, you know, for that process, you know, so especially on a big crew on a big show. So if I've got 20 or 30 people, I'm trying to figure out on every position, how do we just give them, how do we get their space the way that we, we want it? One thing I learned to fight for, and this is different than run of show, but I learned a lot about fighting for space. You know, I just say, this is the space that I need to do the thing. You know, and I'm not going to have my guys crammed into some little closet, you know, and Bruce is a better show. Um, go ahead, Bill. I was also going to say, you want to make sure that you have enough time to where if any up to and including mission critical parts of your audio chain fails, you have time to re-rig everything back to the state it was before. And in fact, almost all of the lavalier microphone makers uh, sell with their high-end lavaliers dual capsule holders, which means you have a mic, a primary and a backup just in case for one weird reason or another, that mic fails, you have a backup to go to. Uh, that's always been part of the business. Audio is, is one of the tougher and the most mission critical things you can do. Yeah, the, the, um, uh, it also really depends on who's getting mic'd, you know, for that. If, if it's a, to get back to what was talked about earlier, if it's a woman with a, with a dress, you need more time, you know, and oftentimes you may need it. Like a lot of times we've gotten used to for larger events, we have a male and a female A2 and we just don't have to worry about it. Like, you know, and, and the female, we have a, what we do is we create a, a curtained box in the back for, for women. We have a, a, a female A2 goes into there and they get it just right. Because what happens is, is it's, it, it, it allows them to have the time and the, you know, to do what needs to be done. A man will never, I mean, some men will do it the way that needs to be done quickly and roughly. And it doesn't have the woman come out on stage in the right energy, <laughs> you know, like, you know, and, and it's just, you know, so in, in this day and age, I would highly recommend that you have, when in doubt, I try to have the A2 be a woman, you know, like, like, like in this case, if I'm, if I'm doing labs, when in doubt, I'll have the A2 be a woman because the men won't care and the women will, you know, and so the, um, and so that's, that's kind of tends to be where I, where I kind of lean towards, but it, otherwise I try to have two that can handle it. And a lot of times you want two anyway, because if you're doing a lot of these, like if you have, if you have an all day thing, you need two A2s, you know, to, to manage that. Go ahead, Bill. Plus one on that. Uh, miking somebody is one of the most invasive things you can do. Often it happens right before a show. This is a performer who has to go out on stage and be in the right mental space. What Alex was talking about is incredibly important. And also sometimes you're working with true professionals or say models and they don't care. They've been fiddled yeah. over so much by costumers or whatever that they don't care what happens. I just love, you can always tell the broadcasters because the broadcasters and the politicians, they'll be talking to somebody like they'll be looking over talking to and they just pull out their, they just open up their, their, 
their jacket. Like, I just do whatever you need to do while yeah, I'm talking. Pull out here. the tail of the shirt okay. and just like, go do it. I don't care. Yeah. But on the other hand, you can get a, a not professional and that invasion of their space yeah. without being incredibly right. sensitive to their emotions can put them into a weird space and will mess up their entire performance. And we have some artists that just don't like to be touched. And we have some executives and everything else that don't like to be touched. So we change the way we mic them. Like this is, and we make a plan and sometimes we don't even get to see them until we see them. And so the other thing you want to think about with Mike, I know we're going way off. We probably spent an hour talking about miking. Um, but the, uh, but we have tons of ways of attaching a mic to somebody that are sitting on a table that we make a decision about, oh, that person's, you know, and that we know that this person doesn't like to have anyone touch them. So we're going to attach it to their, we need a different kind of attachment to just throw it on, you know, quickly. Cause we're going to have like a second to do it before they're frustrated with us. Um, next question. Seven Scroll in Brooklyn has the next one. In prepping for your run of show, do you find more success printing out run sheets for yourself and the team, or do you leave it digital? Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, in the olden days, you know, you would run a script and you'd have to print it in different colors. Oh, we're on the blue copy now. We're on the pink copy. Um, so people didn't get confused. I can't imagine in 2022 in the 21st century using paper for something like this. It just seems like a nightmare. That being said, I still want to develop my ultimate run of show software and I need somebody to help me do it. Good. Bill. I have it all up here. I always have both available because I don't know. There's there's going to be the, oh, you know, a weird person who wants to do what that camera operator tonight should have. They needed a piece of paper and they taped it there and they've been doing it for 30 years. And without that piece of paper there, I suppose probably at one point they're going to replace that with a big iPad or something like that. And I all well and good. But I want to have both available. You're just trying to make all of your crew people feel comfortable that they're getting runs of shows the way that they're used to working with them. Yeah, I mean, in, in most of the time, I say 99% of the time, we keep it, we try to keep everything digital because the paper creates confusion. Like it's just that there's now a bunch of versions of things, you know, there's a bunch of versions of the truth floating around. And so we try to keep it digital. And then occasionally right before the show, there's almost always a printout somewhere. Like there's a printout that you can go to in case we lose connection or we lose something there, people get printouts, but it's like the last hour, last half hour, we're going to, we're going to print these out because otherwise it's constantly moving. And people are like, well, that's not what it says on my sheet, you know? And, and so the more, then that's where, we use things like, you know, um, uh, rundown creator or, you know, so rundown creator is, is one of the ones that, that we've used in the past, um, as well as, um, because it has time and stuff like that. And it'll do a whole bunch of things. It'll have a whole bunch of divisions and t people, uh, working on it. And then we also use, um, you know, the, the most popular is Google docs. <laughs> so the, is the, is the, uh, is the one, but rundown creators, it's kind of like Google docs, but with all the extra tools and it's probably halfway towards what Chris wants to do. Uh, next question. Fleety in Bali, Indonesia says, after yesterday's shoot, I pondered using a Google Sheet with relative timings and input for the actual start time after our talent was late. Has anyone tried this? Uh, yeah, our, our run times rarely have times on them as much as they have t elapsed time. So we definitely have, my, you know, yesterday my show started 10 minutes late because the place wasn't filled. <laughs> you know, like people that were going to be there weren't there, you know, so, so you just, um, and usually it's talent, talent's late. I mean, the, the number one reason if, and I can just tell you as a production person, if it starts late because you're, it's your fault. This might be the last time you ever do anything with that client. Um, you want it to start because it's, uh, the talent's fault and the talent is usually 95% of it. And you know what? Just let them do their thing. Like it, you want to try to make it on time. You want to build all the environments so that they're on time and they're ready to go. But a hard start is a great way to screw up your whole event. So if you need a minute or two to do something a little bit longer, if you're in broadcast, this is a different thing. Like you got to be ready, but you hopefully have a professional that knows how to do that. But when you're dealing with corporate events or live streams, I have learned over time. I used to be really particular and anybody who works with me knows that even this show, we do everything we, we can do to the show on YouTube starts within a second of the atomic time. So we start early for the show to make sure it hits. So I love the precision of being right on time, you know, for a lot of these things. Uh, but what I will say is that in a lot of live shows, I just let them roll until, you know, if it's talent based, I want them to be settled and ready. There's nothing that I'm going to buy for another two or three minutes of them just kind of already 30 seconds for them to, um, you know, to kind of settle in. And, and again, this has to do with folks that are less, experienced that we had famous one in our, in our company, we had one of our producers run up, run up to, you know, Soledad O'Brien and um, to tell her something. And they were kind of in a rush because in Soledad, she was like, calm down, honey, we got 30 seconds. 
like, and you realize when you work with someone that that pro, like she's done this a thousand times, like 30 seconds is an eternity for her. Like, you know, and so, and, and that's, that's what you get when you get real. And the one thing I will say about run of shows is you want to think about your run of show based on your host. Your host is going to define it. Like we can do things with, with a, a solo dad or Brian or a Katie Couric or someone else like that, that we can't do with a corporate person because they can't do it. So when you look at the run of shows, it's not just what the run of show is, but who is actually running that run of show. It makes a big difference. Go ahead, Bill. And, you know, that we've got the classic, everybody understands this, the, it, building in some things that will allow you to stretch time if they... If the, the host is late or if, you know, somebody gets sick or they, you know, stub yeah. their toe and they're, you know, you've got to have that that flexibility of time is the producer and or director's job to make sure that you've got built in pads. So that if something goes crazy wrong, you can keep doing it until you can get back on the rails. And that's the big selling point for uh, a pre-show. So in a run of show, that's why pre-shows are great because A, they get way more attention. B, they get great inter audience interaction. They get people actively listening and thinking about things. And C, you have flexible start time. And and man, <laughs> we've, we've had, we had one executive that was late every single time. He had to do a keynote and every single time. And uh, we had hit, with the person doing the pre-show, someone would be by the camera going like this. Our stage, our stage person was just going like, we're just going to keep going like this. And he would just keep talking. And he would talk and he'd interview more people and he'd do other things and everything else. And, and so that's why the pre-show, as far as a run of show, is one of the best ways to kind of manage this. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, oftentimes in the last minutes up to, you know, the go hour for the shows that I direct, I'm, I'll, I'll look at the client and say, do you want me to start on time or do you want me to wait until you guys are ready? Cause there's a million things that might, that they might want <clears throat> to, that they might want to polish. Maybe they're waiting for more people to enter a hall. Maybe they're waiting for more questions to come in. Maybe their streaming is not working, whatever it is. And I'll just go, I can go on time or I can wait. You tell me. And you know, they always and I will. And, and, and I will tell them I'm, <laughs> I can be more assertive as you might guess. And I say, I recommend we wait. <laughs> like, like, I, like, let's, let's let them settle. Like I, I will not ask them. I will tell them that I think that that's the way that they want to do it. Um, cause I'm, uh, as a producer, I'm less at risk. <laughs> what you say? I, 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 I recommend that we wait and let them get settled. But it's kind of nice because you turn it into an opportunity to do what they want. Yeah. Would you like, yeah. would you like me to wait? Okay. Yeah. We'll stand down. No, no, I, I, and I, and I, I often, I, We'll say, I think we should probably wait, but l let me know what you want to do. You know, like it's, it's definitely, uh, with, with clients that know, I mean, I will say that I'm more assertive with clients that don't know, because a lot of times our job when clients who don't do a lot of shows, our job is to keep them away from the sharp edges, you know, and they'll get into this state that they just had to come out on time and there's all these people and everything else. And you have to be the calm one in the group that says, uh, 99% of your audience is going to come later. <laughs> Let's make sure that we get out of the gate, you know, relatively well. Um, but the other thing is, is to quietly build an infrastructure that is going to start on time. You know, and that's something that, and there's some things that are out of your control that you can't do, but you getting people into the room on time, getting things. And that's, a, again, part of your 30 minute before run of show is where is my talent? Where are my, you know, like I have multiple rows of what's going on. And one of them is like the talent will be here. This will be here. And the talent, you know, we don't need the talent to be standing by the stage for 20 minutes, but we do need them in it. That's, and, and again, I know this sounds crazy, but inside of a run of show con conversation, where you put the green room makes a difference. You know, the green room should be as close to the stage as possible and as nice as possible. You want them to love being in the green room, you know, because that's, that means that they're not somewhere else. Like, the, the, you know, great food, um, you know, great lighting, a place to hang out, like a really comfortable green room. We've, we built green rooms that are, you know, nicer than any room in my house you know, because they, because that draws the talent, what you want to do is draw the talent closer to the production, um, but still give them the isolation that they need so that they're close. And that again, knowing where the talent is ahead of time makes a big difference on, you can't say they're going to be in the green room if it's a, it's a bad little room, <laughs> like, you know, like they're not going to want to be there if they're executives. Um, but if you give them a grand room, you can say, we're going to put them there and they're probably going to be there. Uh, next question. Craig McFarland in Boston, Massachusetts writes this, I find that a wide range of collaboration skills often limits what's possible that needs coordination between multiple people. It can also overwhelm if they see too much of the big plan. Is this typical? Uh, yeah, I mean, we, 
we try to give people just what they need. We may have a really complex run of show. We just need them to know what they need to do. You know, so like that's, you know, like that you don't need, you don't need everybody to know what needs to get done. You just need them to know their part and we're going to come to you at this point and this is what we need to do. And this is what they're going to say to you, but you don't need to, you definitely don't want to show a runner show to someone who doesn't, hasn't seen one before um, because it's, it can be overwhelming. Go ahead, Bill. I think it also depends on the spirit of the thing. I was astonished. You know, we were out there for the rocket launch for office hours space and I, we had 10 people who run shows all doing cruise shops. I mean, these at any one of these people was a high level production professional. Mm -hmm. And so watching them stand back and get into their lanes and realize that they weren't responsible for everything, they were responsible for their part of it was a joy to see in action. It was the removal of the ego and getting out of the normal mode that some of us have all been in for years when we've been the responsible party saying, if I don't say that you have to do this right now, no one else is and the show will suffer for it. When you have multiple voices, it gets more complex. I will say that in every chain of command, having a defined boss and, and knowing that that flow usually makes for a much better production. That is pretty important. You go ahead, Chris. Yeah, for the record, Bill, my ego was very much there and getting beat up the whole time. Um, <laughs> the, uh, I think what you mentioned, Alex, is about um, oftentimes the run of show is overwhelming is one of the main things in my mind for the software I want to build is that every person would be able to design exactly the things that they need to see. You know, it's all there. It's all under the the hood. But I get to decide. You know, like let's say I'm the tape op. Do, do we still well, you know, that's what tape op. Play that's actually engineer? that's actually what what rundown creator does is everyone gets their own. You have a big rundown creator of all the rundowns for everybody, and then you have um, or is it Showflow? I always get the two of them mistaken. I think it's no, it's Showflow. I think actually is the one that that we use that for that. And everybody has the camera operators have their cues. The audio people have their cues. Lighting has their cues. But they only see one. They only see their their slot, slot, you know, their lane. But yeah, you're right that showing everybody, and we oftentimes don't show the runner show to everybody because they don't need to know. Like, you know, you, you know, like they don't need to know what this, what's going to happen next or say it. That's how like product releases get leaked, you know, like, so, <laughs> you know, like, you know, so, so the, you know, the camera operators need to know that someone's going to come on a stage and, da, 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 you know, like, so a lot of times I work on a lot of shows that are like, everybody's on a need to know basis. And if you're smart, you don't want to know. Like you don't want to know anything outside of your lane. Like there's people who are curious don't get to come back. <laughs> you know, like literally, if you're curious enough to ask, you don't get to come back. Like you know, no one, you know, and so. Hey, what's under the black curtain over there? You can leave now. Yeah, I, it's like they don't want you around. And you learn to be consciously uninterested in whatever's being released. Uh, and And by the way, the other thing, by the way, this is probably, again, another rat hole. We got plenty of time and not that many questions. Um, I don't assign people to things. I don't assign crew to things that they care about. <laughs> I, had a, I had a guy that was really into basketball. And when we did events with basketball players, he wasn't allowed to play. He wasn't allowed to come. And the reason is, is because they get, they get too into the content, you know? And so I always assign, I build teams around people who, I mean, when I build like big production teams, I try to build them on people who won't be interested in the subject matter at all. Like, I don't want them to care about the subject matter. They should care about their craft, you know, and they should be uh, focused on, you know, what they're going to do and not, not get caught up in the conversation as best we can. Um, next question. Next one is from Douglas Carmichael. Have you ever documented specific emergency plans for common contingencies as part of a run of show? For example, what if the lead presenter drops dead? How dark. Douglas, Super dark. He just went all Douglas. the way to DC. I mean, you're like, it was, <laughs> I mean, it was like the next Batman film. All right, go ahead, Chris. That's exactly what I wanted to say. It's like, good grief, Douglas. How, how dark can you go? Um, no, I will say that we were making plans uh, on a couple of shows when we were really worried about, okay, now if this guy gets COVID, then we have to do this and this. So yeah, sometimes you have to make, uh, th there was a lot of fear of, especially when Omicron first hit, it was like, okay, so, and then what if they get COVID, you know, so. Yeah, we've, we, the COVID contingencies have been just a nightmare for us to figure out because you just don't know. And then the client doesn't want to spend twice as much money to have backups that are around and but profitable. <laughs> exactly. So the, um, the, uh, the a couple, you know, we don't put them necessarily in the run of show. We definitely have, uh, we, we have things that like a lot of emergency slates or we know what slate we're going to go to if something isn't working. It might be just the same slate we're using, but we definitely do a we'll be right back or, you know, those types of things are starting soon if something needs to be done. 
uh, so there's some contingencies that are there. Um, we do talk about a lot of times I use um, when we're building sets, I often, not all the time, but very often we'll do time lapses. So I'll ask for a time lapse and, or I have like this little bag because we're doing all this stuff. We have, I have a bags and bags of GoPros. <laughs> so because we're doing things that required six GoPros at a time. And so I'll just put them up all over the place and then I'll, I'll do these time lapses. The time lapses are oftentimes my parachute because the oftentimes, not all the time, the, the what we found is the dwell time on our streams is higher during the time lapse than it is during the content. <laughs> So people will watch time lapses forever. So it's it, a we'll be right back. We did one. We did one for Essence Festival. That was my best one. It was we we it, I put it up on this. There was a bridge going across in New Orleans, the br bridge in, inside the New Orleans Convention Center. And I set this one up, and it just you just got to watch the expo get built. And then we did um, we did a uh, I used um, Echo time echo in after effects which you can't do in motion for some reason and um, it's a way that they manage time and built this thing where it was all just this wash of people like because it, it built a motion blur for it over time and uh and it was a we'll be right back slide and it was a couple of times we used it you know on a th on a three-day event that were that runs almost 24 7 you'll have a couple of times we need to do it and people people loved it like they're like where did that come from you know and um and so uh so it, it can be it can really um having good contingencies and great things that you can go to sometimes it's just an outer shot like a external shot it can be a crowd shot that's at the escalators like the Moscone has these great escalators that come down on the south hall it's not called the south hall anymore but I, I don't remember what it's called now and um you can you can get this great you know these great shots of it and people love those kind as backups um we do have things in our not in our again run a show I can say it now because I'm probably never going to do a big show again. Um, but uh, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not interested in going to places. Uh, we used to have a um, uh, a code that was we would say Super Six Four. Super Six Four we never used. That's a that is a kinetic threat, you know, because we were doing events that were, um, you know, we had threats to the events and to the people in the events and you know fatwas and all that stuff. And so in our thing was we talked about where people go what entrance what we're going to do but if someone leaned forward and said uh super six four into the mic everyone just dropped what they did and walked away like and we were you know and sometimes we practice it sometimes we you do it but uh, super six four is related to um mogadishu <laughs> so you can you can do a search for that but it was like but if we said super six four it meant everybody get out of the get out of the space you know and um and we never had to use it, but we always had it there. You know, when did when did Noah build the ark before the rain? <laughs> All right, go ahead, Chris. Um, I'm I'm stuck on Super Six Four. Uh, I pass. Okay, good. Uh, go ahead, Bill. Well, I will say that you know, having done a couple of gigs during COVID um, that for relatively large companies, there were I was surprised at how much when the COVID testing had to come on site, they took. Um, even emergency medicine and things like that much more seriously to the point where I've been working on gigs occasionally where there are actually medical personnel around that. Now that may fade away as the threat of something like COVID goes away and budgets do not have as big a keep the crew safe thing. I, I can see Alex's point really well. If you're working in something that close to a war zone, that may be a hugely the, more important budget. It wasn't, budget wasn't close to a war zone. It was, it was a, it was that the war zone might come to, I mean, it was in yeah. San Francisco or in, right. in Chicago. It was just, if you have world leaders or if you have high profile individuals there, you, you worry about bad things happening. You know, like yeah. it's just, you have to be, you know, ready. <laughs> yeah. Break for the bomb squad. It's a whole different level yeah. of <laughs> be concerned. You know, it's, it's a, it, it, you just have to be conscious that, um, again, you don't want to be the one that didn't plan for it, you know, and, and, and again, I think that part of it is because I have worked in a lot of places that are pretty stressful, um, that you think about those things like those are, and it's one of the reasons I admit that I don't like crowds. Like the reason I don't like crowds is because I work with people who manage threats inside of crowds and I, and you just realize there's no way to control it. Like there's no way to be safe. <laughs> like, like there's no, like large crowds are not safe, you know, and, and um, anybody who wanted to cause trouble there will cause trouble. And so, so part of it is, is that I'm constantly aware of what, of all the unsafety of any crowd over about a thousand people. 
Um, uh, next question. Danny Law in Malaysia comes up with the next one. He says, when hiring actors to run through a rehearsal, do you look for those who are similar physically to the talent in order to work out things like headroom and lighting? I go ahead, Bill. And, and sometimes, I mean, you know, you need a body there. If you're doing a light plot, you want to make sure everything is correct. You need somebody on stage uh, in order to set lights. Uh, the body is the most important thing. So we'll usually just look around and whoever is the least busy at the moment and has the time to do that, we'll do that. If we can find somebody who has similar characteristics, like if you know that your presenter has ash blonde hair and that's going to be an issue for setting a backlight and you can find somebody else with light hair, yeah, get them in. Uh, so the more similarity to the actual show conditions that you can make your rehearsals, the better. But it, it never stops for me saying, yeah, all I got is a shorter blonde guy over here, but our sh let's put him in for the tall brunette because I need a face. I, if I get the basic set plot lit and correctly set for even a different person, I'm just going to make adjustments rather than that's the point where I find out that I need a different light or a different angle or something. Yeah, we do everything we can to match uh, the complexion uh, and gender of the of the person that's going to be up there um, because that helps us a lot. Uh, when we told the story, we we used to do stuff for the White House uh, in the previous or two previous administrations. And uh, Frederick Johnson, who is um, you know he does uh, this week in photo, and he's been on a bunch of stuff. He's he was our this is the, I can tell it now because it's a long time ago. But but he was the the faux potus the fopo we called him the fopo and and uh and um, so when we did stuff because he had the same complexion and same height as Obama. And, or rough, almost the same height, within an inch. Chris, your your mic's open, and um, the uh, so he was the same there. And the, to, the added bonus is Frederick can pull off great answers. Like he is, he can think on his feet and do that thing. And so he was the part. And every year, like clockwork, we 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 would do something there about once or twice a year, and we'd call Fred. Like you ready, you know, Frederick? Here we go. You ready? We got a, We got another another date in uh, January and in, in Washington D.C. and I got to tell you, it makes such a huge difference. Like, it, you know, it's something when you think about the overall budget to pay someone to be as close to the person that you're going to do it, especially on a high profile event, if you're doing a smaller event or if you're doing, if there's seven people or there's whatever, you, you can't necessarily do that. But the closer you can get to someone who can actually even pull off the answers, it just makes it so much easier to figure this stuff out. And it's something that I thought was really, we used to just throw PAs in there and have them sit there. And then there was a... Uh, the first, I think it was a Dreamforce maybe 10 years ago, we put in actors and I was like, oh my gosh, why did I not do this before? <laughs> like it was just, it just cleaned up the show because we're, you know, we're figuring stuff out and we're, and they're talking back and forth. By the way, if you're searching for actors, comedians are the best. Comedians and improv are the, are the ones you're looking for. Those you can, a lot of times in casting things, you can like say what you're looking for. They think on their feet better and they're much more fun for the, for the, they, the comedians are much more fun for the crew because they will just go off and say all kinds of funny things about the you know like they'll they'll just say funny things and get everybody laughing while they're working on it and it's just a lot less dry you know so uh but but actors in general and you really want you want to try to find actual actors in most cities there's a lot of stage actors that aren't you know they're not super ex expensive to hire um and uh having them actually do the thing rather than just be at a pa because you get a PA out there and they'll go, someone will, the, the person practicing will call to them and they'll go, yeah, yeah, that's great. You know, <laughs> and, and, and sitting in the back, I'm like, that doesn't help me. <laughs> like, like, I need you to like, do the thing, like do the thing that we were gonna do. And uh, it really is, will change your shows dramatically. Now, next question. Craig McFarland's up next from Boston and he says, rundown creator and show flow look great, but outside budgets, is there something between those and roll your own? I will say, that outside of Rundown Creator and Showflow, it's Google Docs. Like I, and I will say Google Docs is still 90% of what all of us use for it. I mean, I, I, I use these on some, and it's mostly that I like it when someone comes in and wants to use Showflow or Rundown Creator because they both do great things. Um, Showflow is more of a big co corporate show. Rundown Creator is more of a single show that I want to do. Um, and so um, they're, they're just great apps, but most of the time my run of shows and all of our technical TikToks are all in sheets, <laughs> Google sheets, you know, like that's the, that is the, uh, and you go to just a lot of things. Some people will inflict, uh, Excel on you, 
but try try to resist the urge. Numbers will is easier to build it quickly. So what the funny thing is for rundowns, I build everything in numbers, and then I export it out as an XLS, and then I import it into Google uh, because the generation of the doc is about ten times faster in numbers as it is in sheets. Um, but then it's not the collaboration is one tenth of sheets. The collab, collab, Apple hasn't Apple hasn't figured that out yet. <laughs> like how to get the apps to collaborate well. I don't, I don't, I know they do it, but they, you know, again, they don't necessarily do it that well. So I, we put it back in the sheets to, to make that work. All right. That was a fun little, that was a, uh, a fun little conversation. You know, it was funny, you know, not a ton of questions, but good questions that really kind of drove the conversation. And then the panelists did a great job at, at really illustrating some of those things and, and talking through them. So thanks to the producers for all the great questions. Um, and uh, thanks to the panelists. I uh, can't do this without you. And uh, really great, uh, thoughtful commentary today. It was good. It's good. A little slower pace than the other ones, and I liked it. So it's we're we're still always figuring that out. So um, so anyway, now we're going to uh, remember we're talking about gaff tape tomorrow. And I know you don't think that gaff tape is going to be that interesting, but it is. It is. We're going to talk a lot about it. Um, so uh, so stay tuned for that, and um, we'll see who shows up. But people who know how important gaff tape is will show up. We'll see. All right. Um, all right. See, see you all tomorrow in after hours right now. That was such a horrible close. I'm pretty embarrassed. I should have. I don't know what I was doing. You probably should be. You're talking. You're not whispering in the right tone. You need I'm not to, yelling. You need you to be whispering. Back. No. You, you're, you're using it. It's not the right whisper. Do you really think you can talk for an hour about gaff tape? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, I can. I can absolutely talk. I can talk for a day about gaff tape.